Hi and welcome to the introduction for the unit AP 5701, which is all to do with the questions that are related to actual performing and preparing for skin microneedling treatments and chemical peels. So as with previous SAQ papers, there is a minimum pass mark for the questions and overall for the assignments. As in previous things, you're going to be looked and marked on your content, your application of your theory knowledge and showing how you have read and understood your research and put it into your own words. The presentation and formatting has been set and you should be used to this by now and obviously completing work on the performer that is provided from Qualify. Referencing, as we've said, is not a requirement, a compulsory one, but obviously it's something to show the higher knowledge and level of skill and where you are making your assumptions from. To pass this paper, this is the longest one out of them all, it's 12 questions. So it's going to maybe take you a little bit longer than the previous ones. And the high pass mark is 78 points out of 120. This is your minimum pass mark to get that 65%. And remember, your word counts are a guide. Um, some you will get through sort of quicker than others. Um, and when you see the questions, you'll understand why. So this unit is actually a level seven. If you notice, it says unit AP 5701. So there is a mix of levels five and seven within this. So please make sure that you are demonstrating that higher thinking. You need to make sure that you've got that descriptive detail and backed with actual realistic facts and references. So let's look straight at question one. So we're evaluating. So remember, when we're evaluating, we're looking at the positives and negatives and the value of those positives and negatives. You can also put in your own personal opinions. Um, just make sure that those opinions are based on something that you can reference and sort of research methods that can be referenced as well. And again, you can argue with some of the things that you find as well. Again, it's all about making sure you've got that value within your answers. So in this one, you're evaluating the potential impact on the treatment results of not following pre-treatment advice and pre-treatment -pre skin preparation. So this is not what's happening in the treatment or after the treatment. This is all before your client comes. So it's evaluating the suitability or if they need to be prepped for the treatment as well. So question one is asking you to evaluate the potential impact of the treatment results of not following pre-treatment advice and pre-treatment skin preparation. So this is talking about some of the treatments might need to have your clients prep their skin, which is sometimes for the stronger peels or building up to the stronger peels. Or obviously, if their skin is not very intact and they've had a lot of neglect, their skin might not be ready to go with the treatments and the more aggressive nature. So you need to make sure that you're giving them advice. Also, you need to make sure that they're aware of any patch tests of any serums or pat peels that need to be done. You need to talk to them about sun exposure and products to avoid before and immediately after. So this can sometimes be done with a consultation before your client comes. You'll see here on your marking criteria, obviously to get the higher marks we've already talked about you know research and um, acknowledging that research that you have done and making sure you determine the value of why your clients should have their skin prepped prior to receiving these treatments so question two we're evaluating again the positives and negatives your opinions and basing those opinions on facts and not just something that can't be actually sort of referenced within your assignment so we're now looking at um, numbing cream, so topical anaesthetic creams. So you're evaluating the types, the uses, and obviously the limitations and risks of putting on um, numbing cream within skin microneedling. We're obviously not doing that in chemical peels. So it's again being very specific and asking you about the skin needling. 
So with your marking criteria and sort of becoming familiar with what your marker is looking for, when you evaluate the types, uses and limitations of your numbing cream or your topical local anaesthetic, with specifically to do with skin microneedling, remember that's also needling with your roller and your pen. So you can talk about what is topical local anaesthetic, what are the legalities within the UK of applying and providing TLA, is it something that your insurance covers you for? What are the advantages of using topical local anaesthetic? And then obviously on the flip side, what are the disadvantages or are there any side effects? So you can think about how topical local anaesthetic, there is limits in this country of 5% or under. You cannot be putting large amounts more than a size of an A4 on the paper. You can be talking about the it's an added cost to the treatment and you've got to leave it on for 30 minutes. So is it convenient to be able to do that within your practice? So what is your opinion on when you find the advantages and disadvantages? Finish your discussion with your opinion and what you think you should and shouldn't do. And remember, base this on fact, not opinion. So question three, we've now got a new command verb. We've got examine. So we're going to inspect closely. You're taking apart something and then examining all the little parts of it, looking at the differences, what the theory is behind it, and again, the value of it. So this time we're going to be examining how the Fitzpatrick and the Glogau skin classification systems impact on chemical peel and microneedling treatments. You may have heard of the Fitzpatrick scale before, uh, but the Glogau might be something new to you. So the Glogau scale you might be not too familiar with. It's actually a sort of a newer scale in comparison to the Fitzpatrick and was developed in 1994 by Dr. Richard Glogau. And it's mainly aimed at evaluating and pinpointing someone with a Caucasian skin and how their sun damage and exposure to photoaging has sort of caused their skin to be in within a certain grade. Grade one being the mildest and 10 being the most um, affected. You know, using this scale, a practitioner can obviously then sort of talk about premature aging and classifying their client within a scale. And ideally, it might be something to sort of say to them, you are a grade four, so you are never going to get down further than maybe a grade three. We cannot bring you back down to a grade one. So it's giving them that realistic expectation. So become familiar with it. Talk about it in your assignment and sort of decide, do you think it's a good scale or not. Then your Fitzpatrick scale you should be more um, aware of as part of your usual sort of classifications when you're doing your consultations. Um, obviously it's a much older classification system from 1975 and again it's still to do with that um, how UV light photo ages the skin um, and it's obviously linked to um, sort of the ethnicity and skin tones, as well as obviously how much that someone can sunburn or tan. It's obviously a good tool to sort of think about, especially with these microneedling chemical peel treatments, you have to be more aware of um, your post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation within our Fitzpatrick's three and above, but also our Fitzpatrick's one and two with our post-inflammatory erythema and more likely to have redness and maybe that redness lingering a little bit longer as well. So obviously it's not that some skins are safer than others, each skin Fitzpatrick will have possibly different risks associated to it. So as the question is asking, it's asking you to examine how these scales, so you can do a brief introduction, but it's more about examining how they actually impact on chemical peels and microneedling. So don't go talking too much about what they are, just give a brief introduction, state what they are, who they're designed for, and do you think they're significant within your assignment? You will go into these a little bit more, or if you already haven't completed your assignments, your more detailed ones, they will be in there. But you can obviously talk about the value of them and the significance, and this is what's going to give you your higher grades and making sure you're always linking it back to aesthetic practice.
So question four, we're back to sort of evaluating again. So most of the questions you've done are evaluating. So we're looking at the positives and negatives and how those positives and negatives can form your opinion. Um, and obviously whether you agree or disagree with it and obviously how they relate to the treatments that you are performing. So for this question, we are evaluating the legal requirements for informed client consent and the recording and retaining of client records. So it's about making sure that you've sat down with your client and explained the treatment process, the before, the after, the possible negative consequences, and how you are recording that you've done that with your clients and then retaining that information. So we're evaluating the legal requirements for informed client consent. And this is a big, massive thing with the regulation that is due to be coming in and making sure you record and retain all that client's information. So it's about important that you have asked them information, recorded information and got them to sign things. So apart from the legality of maintaining client records, what other information do you need and what is the value of this information? Making sure that you mention things like GDPR and the Information Commission Office. You can compare electronic records and paper-based ones and look at the legalities around it. You might refer back to any of your previous assignments that have took, looked at the legalities also and look at some of your resources. So making sure that if you're looking for those higher grades, you know, what is the purpose of an informed consent? How does it help you? How does it help the client? And what's the value of doing this within aesthetic practice? So question five, we're again back to our evaluating. So hopefully it doesn't need too much introduction. So you're looking at the positives and negatives and sort of determining their value to form your own opinion. And we are now looking at the different types of chemical peels, their benefits, effects, and limitations. Now, remember the it is expected wear count of 300 to 500. You don't get marked down for going over, but you might get marked down if you've waffled for too long and you've gone on over your word count and there wasn't any significance to it, or you've just spent a lot of time waffling and you don't get any extra marks for it. So be aware of sometimes is sort of in a nutshell or summarizing is a way of shortening your word count. So this one, you're looking at the different types of chemical peels. So you can talk about, you know, the benefits of them and also their effect they have on the skin and their limitation. So you can discuss things like strength appeal, superficial, medium, deep. Are there limits to who can do what type of peel? Are there limits over who can have what kind of peel? Look at the specific ingredients and compare things like salicylic and the phenol peels and TCA. Um, and think about which peel ingredients you use and the benefits of them. Benefits of peels, you know, to specific skin conditions like salicylic acid is much better for your um, acne type clients, yet your mandelic acid is much better for your pigmentation and your higher Fitzpatrick's, you know, your glycolic for aging, your lactic, which is more sensitive because it's a larger molecule. Things like this you need to find out about. And there are many things on Google Scholar that will cover this. So you have to evaluate the different types of peels, the benefits, the limits to them and the value of understanding and having this information within aesthetic practice. So let's face it, the more knowledgeable a practitioner is, the better the treatment will be for your client. So question six, we've got to analyse. We're still sticking with the peels. We are analysing in which skin depth, the pH, the layering, the timing, the neutralization and frequency of chemical peels can have an impact on the results. So that's a lot to cover within three to 500 words. Hence why I've said sometimes you may go a little bit over. I don't know how anyone could complete this in 300 words. So you can look at each thing individually and talk about different peels, penetrating deeper down. You can talk about the pH scale, how you can put about layering, the peel so putting one layer on waiting a time putting another layer on you can even talk about patchwork in peels where you can use one type of peel for pigmentation on the cheeks and another peel for the congestion on the t-zone 
You can also talk about the timing of the peels. How long should they be on? Are also some neutralizing themselves? So self-neutralizing peels or do they need to be neutralized? So all of these will have an impact on the treatment results. Make sure you should try and be using examples in your own practice um, as well as maybe your own experience of having a peel. So some discussion points that you could add in is looking how different layers of skin can be targeted depending on what the skin condition is you're treating. So you can think about how salicylic um, and treating sort of more spots and congestion is more superficial than maybe looking at some of the conditions like aging where you need to target the dermis a bit more to get that collagen production. So you can sort of talk about um, the sort of depth is itself being related to what you're trying to treat. You can also think about the downtime your clients are willing to experience as well it will have an impact on which treatment you decide. Obviously, the higher risk of complications, um, as well as things like post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, prepping of the client's skin beforehand. You can put in what is pH because it's saying to you analyze in which pH is of you know it has an impact. You know, if someone doesn't know what the pH is, it might be worth sort of writing down what that is and how it's to mimic the skin's antibac layer. How frequent the treatment plan is will determine on the different peels that you're using. Also, it's good to point out like the neutralization of peels. Like I've said to you before, some of the peels, when you neutralize them, can actually sting worse um because of the exothermic reaction that the neutralization is so some people actually find the neutralization more uncomfortable than the peel itself how can that be managed sort of after the treatment or during the treatment as well again look at your marking criteria so we're looking at making sure that you might have outlined the way in which everything is of importance but you've not really elaborated and given any specific examples and then obviously taking it up to the higher marks is what could be the consequences if you don't use it correctly or you don't follow sort of the processes that you should do. Again, it's all about that value. So thinking about sort of the possible results if you use the wrong peel or you don't neutralize properly um, or listen to maybe what the client is telling you with regards to their downtime they wish to experience or the event they might be doing it for. So question seven, we're staying with the evaluate as well. So positives, negatives and forming your own opinion. We're evaluating how to manage any complications and adverse effects that can occur during or following your chemical peel. So you can be thinking about, you know, letting your client be aware of what might tingle, what sensations might be experienced, what the downtime might look at, sort of within the treatment itself and obviously straight after and over the sort of coming days straight after the treatment as well. So we've got to evaluate on how to manage complications. We have to look on the negative side of the treatment to be able to effectively manage that as well. So you can talk about what complications can occur and what are normal and what's not normal. Like a complication a client might see is peeling skin as an adverse effect, but we know that's normal. So they should be prepared for that prior to the treatment. You know, why could something have occurred? Have they followed the aftercare properly? Did they prep their skin? Did they lie to you on the consultation? Are they using actives and didn't tell you? Um, how can you reduce the risk of a complication by doing thorough consultations, making sure you build your client up? Don't go in with the strongest peel thinking that's going to give them the best results because it might not. And obviously how to manage these complications. A massive complication is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So managing that is suitable. Making sure with chemical burns or obviously clients not following aftercare advice. If there's infection, you might need to get a prescription. So all of these you need to research. And obviously, the more detail you put in and determine the value of this research will give you the higher grades.
So now we're moving on to microneedling. We've moved away from chemical peels, but it's very similar to how you've been answering the questions prior to this on chemical peels. You're now going to answer the same things on microneedling. So you have to list like the benefits, the effects, and the limits of what manual and power system microneedling can do. Talk about the positives and the negatives as well. So again, you could sort of do your introduction on sort of how microneedling works. So, you know, the whole reason for the treatment being effective. You can talk about the positives and negatives of manual roller and power assisted devices. So again, you can talk about how the pens can be adjusted in depth throughout the whole treatment. They're easier to get in around maybe some of the sort of more corners. Um, and obviously, don't forget, we're doing body treatments as well as our faces. You can talk about, um, obviously, manual rollers we don't need to be charged, so they're available. Um, again, looking at the positives and negatives, and you can obviously put it on sort of your um, own experience as well. Which skin complaints are we targeting? So I think microneedling is not really one for the active acne and spots. It's more for the scarring um, and aging. So you can obviously look at sort of how the potential results can be linked and the results are what gives you that higher mark. So you can be making sure that you pick the right treatment plan for the clients to give them the results that they're wanting. And then sticking with the microneedling, question nine. Um, so this is where it's making sure that for question eight, you don't sort of cover question nine at the same time, because then you sort of find you've run out of things to talk about in the other bit. So it's good to look at all your questions. But question nine is now looking specifically more at the needle depth and how often the treatments should happen um, and also sort of how long the treatments take to do themselves. Um, and then obviously the serum that you use to microneedle in. So you're going to analyze the way in which needle depth, treatment duration, frequency of skin microneedling and the application of adjunctive topical skin products during the treatment can have an effect on the results. Again, make sure you link it to your own practice and your own opinions, positive and negative. So as you can see on this one, we've got to analyse the way in which needle depth, um, the treatment duration, the frequency of the treatments and the application of the products, um, how they have an impact on the skin. So you can see, again, a lot to get in in just a short space of time. So you need to think about the research that you're doing and obviously putting it in very simplified terms. So you can talk about the needle depth, that it's like a very old fashioned way of thinking the deeper it is, the better it is. From my own research, I found that wasn't the case. Um, you can talk about what serums to use and why you should use those and which serums you should maybe not use things like you can buy in boots. So um, there was a really good research. I would recommend if you're researching anything to do with microneedling, looking up Dr. Lance Setterfield as well. He's seen as the guru for um, microneedling. So question 10, we're still evaluating. So again, we're sticking with the microneedling and very similar to how you did with the previous question on chemical peel. We're now looking at how you manage complications and the contraactions, the adverse effects that can occur sort of at the time of the treatment or after the treatment. So again, we're looking at the positives and negatives and again, looking at forming your opinion based on what information you find. So as we did with our previous question on chemical peels, we're going to have exactly the same thing to do with um, how to deal with any complications and adverse effects after microneedling. Think about your wound healing response, um, what could be occurring, you know, bleeding, normal, um, redness, normal, but it should go down. Um, making sure clients are following aftercare advice. Something to be aware of is obviously, again, the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and tram tracking. So you may want to sort of look up what is microneedling and tram tracking and how that is an adverse effect as well. So this question, question 11, is going to be back to, it's not looking at microneedling or chemical peels, it's looking at them both together. 
So you're looking again now at the use of sort of skincare products, um, things that can be done at home. This is pre-treatment and after the treatment. So again, can we link to your aftercare about clients not using sort of actives for a certain period straight after, why that is, the positives and negatives. Obviously, um, thinking about sort of how you can get your client the best results by then preparing their skin and obviously maintaining their skin in between treatments. So remember, this is for both treatments, microneedling and chemical peels, and it's talking about like your skincare products that you recommend that they use pre and post. So make sure in your assignment you're talking about pre-treatment advice and post-treatment advice. You know, the main things with SPF or staying away from actives and what they can do in between treatments to support the healing as well as the results. And then we're on to the last question. So we're now evaluating, um, and this time we're looking at a bit more anatomy and physiology, as it were, but we're now looking at the principles of the wound healing response or the skin healing, as they've worded it on this question. So again, we're going back to science, which I find very easy to sort of link to um, when we're trying to find research as well. But both of these treatments, whether they're chemical peels or microneedling, all work on a sort of wounding of the skin to initiate um, the skin healing response, which is where we'll get the magic happening. So the skin healing is very obvious why it would be in here. Um, we're going back to the anatomy and physiology. And remember, there's four stages to the skin healing. So roughly, you can think about doing 100 words for each one, and then obviously just doing a little bit of a conclusion at the end. You have to determine the value and how they support the healing and how they basically get the benefits of microneedling. How is causing trauma? beneficial to the skin and that's what you've got to kind of go through to explain how your client will get the results due to this trauma.